Welcome to the session on Edmund Husserl. Edmund Husserl, the father of phenomenology, was born in 1859 in Prosnitz, a village in Czechoslovakian Moravia, which at that time formed part of the Austrian Empire. Though he was initially trained in mathematics and physics at Leipzig in, and Berlin, his transfer to the University of Vienna and a short term of teaching career at Hall brought about a shift in interest towards philosophy. In 1900, accepting an invitation to join the philosophy faculty, he moved to Göttingen, where he subsequently became professor in philosophy. In 1916, he obtained a full professorship at Freiburg, where he remained until his retirement. The last years of his life were uh, overshadowed by Nazi politics, though his uh, death in 1938 saved him from witnessing the war unleashed with Hitler's invasion of Poland. Major works are Philosophy of Arithmetic, published in 1891, Logical Investigations in 1901, Ideas Pertaining to a Pure Phenomenology and to a Phenomenological Philosophy, published in 1913. Cartesian Meditations and the Crisis of uh, European Sciences and Transcendental Phenomenology. The Three Phases The philosophical development of the founder of phenomenological movement in modern philosophy can be divided into three main phases. The first phase of his uh, pre-transcendental or epistemological phenomenology. Second, the middle phase of his fully transcendental phenomenology and the last phase of his so-called genetic phenomenology. Of these, the phase which is of methodological interest is the middle one, during which he developed the transcendental phenomenology proper. Hence, our focus will be on that phase. However, the pre-transcendental or epistemological phase had been preparatory towards the transcendental phase. It was during this phase that he published his philosophy of arithmetic. Just as the title indicates, as a mathematician, Husserl was interested in the foundations of uh, arithmetic. At that time, experimental and philosophical psychology were coming into their own, and Husserl's works derived on them. In it, Husserl required that the objectivity of even the most logical of objectivities be traced back to the structures of consciousness in and through which it first became possible. But this stance was criticized by Frege as the intrusion of psychological considerations into logic, a criticism which Husserl took seriously and as a defense against the same was unfolded the middle phase of fully transcendental phenomenology. Transcendental phenomenology. In Logical Investigations, published in 1901, Husserl gave a new account of logic and mathematics which was anti-psychologistic. According to it, the laws of logic and mathematics are not empirical laws that describe the working of the mind, but ideal laws whose necessity we intuit, that is, see, a priori. In the idea of phenomenology published in 1907, Husserl gave a clear and concise account of his new approach. He conceived philosophy as a rigorous science to which he gave the name phenomenology, whereby he meant a presuppositionless and pure description of the content of consciousness. In the subsequent work, Ideas Pertaining to a Pure Phenomenology and to a Phenomenological Philosophy, published in 1913, he laid down the methodology towards attaining to this ideal. And in this task, he adopted Brentano's thesis that consciousness is intentional. That is, every act of consciousness is directed at some object or other material or ideal. The Phenomenological Method the two main ideas which are constitutive of the method of transcendental phenomenology are the idea of the reduction and the complementary idea of a sphere of immanence or of immanental consciousness. The natural attitude, the reduction and the discourse of a sphere of pure consciousness. Husserl starts with the venerable set of distinctions between the empirical and the a priori and the contingent and the necessary. The empirical sciences are concerned with the contingent facts about the world and its objects. 
though scientism has influenced philosophy in its principles and practices, the concern of philosophical inquiry should not be that of science. True philosophy, that is phenomenology, is not a science of facts, but of essential being which aims exclusively at establishing knowledge of essences which Husserl terms as edos in the ideas. It belongs to the meaning of everything contingent that it should have an edos to be apprehended in all its purity, he states them. And for him, phenomenology is the knowledge of these essences, edos, essences or ideas. As stated, the edos are the necessary essences or ideas in virtue of instantiating which every contingent thing comes into being. Such things can be physical objects, thoughts or values. For example, instantiation of the idea of or essence of man in a particular individual, say Husserl, is what making that particular individual count as a man. Now these essences are characterized by three features. One, there is no existential import for these essences. That is, the positing of essence does not imply any positing of individual existence. Two, an essence is not a psychological item. That is, for their existence, just like numbers, essences are not dependent on any one thinking of them. Three, we can only know essences through a non-perceptual type of intuition, an immediate seeing distinct from the sensory seeing of experience. Whereas perceptual intuition gives objects which are supposed to exist in space and time, essential intuition gives us objects whose existence is not presupposed even though it may very well be illustrated or exemplified with regard to specific instances. And because of this, the intuitive exemplification of the edos or pure essence can take place just as well in fantasy or acts of imaginative intuition. Essential intuition through eidetic reduction. According to Husserl, the essential intuition mentioned above has to be carried out by way of a peculiar process termed as eidetic reduction. The spell of naturalism makes it so difficult for all of us to see essences or ideas, says Husserl in his essay, Philosophy as a Rigorous Science. Our minds are so chalked up with the factual beliefs and scientific presumptions that unless we first clean out this Augean stable, we shall be unable to gain an unimpeded view of the essences. Therefore, the first step in the process of essential intuition is what he calls creation of the epoch. Epoch. The epoch or suspension is described in ideas. In the epoch, I debar myself from using any judgment that concerns spatio-temporal reality, but without denying or doubting such judgments, Husserl states there. Roughly, this is a kind of uh, mental purge akin to Descartes methodological doubt. In epoch, the phenomenologist leaves behind the ordinary natural world, brackets all questions of truth or reality and simply describes the contents of consciousness. It is a kind of uh, abstention from or bracketing of all factual beliefs and uh, scientific presumptions. Thus, in epoch, the external world is set out of action and it is so maintained constantly and uh, vigilantly so that the attention is concentrated on the contents of consciousness. Transcendental ego. Thus, in the first stage of uh, eidetic reduction, one disconnects himself from the external physical world and keeps it bracketed. Once this stage is attained to, the next stage begins, which is more radical. In this stage, there should exist no I. The natural human ego, specifically one's own, it is to be reduced to the transcendental ego. Thus, one must bracket belief in the existence of uh, selves or persons, including one's own self. In as much as uh, human ego is uh, thought of as necessarily embodied, such embodiment too is to be set out of action along with all other physical objects. Thus, everything which retains one's identity as a person over the course of time is suspended. 
and what remains after such absolute bracketing of the empirical ego is what Husserl terms the transcendental ego, the pure consciousness, before which the distilled essences are to be paraded. With this, eidetic reduction comes to its culmination and uh, one is prepared for the development of what Husserl calls the theory of the essential nature of the transcendentally purified consciousness, in which the notion of intentionality is pivotal. Intentionality. Borrowing the idea of intentionality from the influential empirical psychologist and philosopher Franz Brentano and purging it of the naive realism implied in it, Husserl makes it the cornerstone of his new theory. For Brentano, all consciousness by its very nature is a consciousness of something. In other words, it is intentional. And this something is an object, material or ideal, but implicitly real. Imbibing this idea, Husserl analyzes a conscious act into three terms, ego, cogitatio and cogitatum. The ego has a cogitatio directed towards a cogitatum or simply the act indents the object. Every intentional experience and this is indeed uh, the fundamental mark of uh, all intentionality has its intentional object Husserl states in the ideas. The intentional relation is then further specified in two ways. On the one side of the object, the cogitatum splits up into figure and ground. What consciousness is explicitly focused upon and the marginal potentiality which surrounds this focal actuality. On the side of the subject, the cogitatio refers back to the transcendental ego which is involved in the act of conscious awareness. This backward reference is then reinforced with a distinction between immanent and transcendent perceptions. Any cogitatio, say the perception of an object, can itself become the object of a higher order reflective act which makes of this consciousness, of the object and object of reflective consciousness. In so doing, the Brentanoian reference to transcendent reality is replaced with an immanent relation. Thus, whereas for Brentano, the naive unreflective consciousness is carried along by the intentional relation and so comes to accord real being to that which is intended as the correlative of consciousness. For Husserl, who is in the reflective attitude created by the epoch, the focus is transferred from the object itself to the intentional relation in and through which the object is posited as such. Through just such a change in the focus of attention, consciousness is seen to be the absolute with regard to which the natural world enjoys a purely relative being. And these self-contained and absolute immanently directed experiences are what the indubitable foundation for the phenomenologist for any dubitable affirmation of uh, existence. From the standpoint of uh, this new concept of uh, immanence, what we have been regarded as transcendent or uh, transcendent to the life of consciousness must now be treated as immanent and as such available for an analysis whose descriptions operate within the scope of the criterion of indubitable self-evidence. This is how the sphere of immanence or of immanental consciousness is constituted. One note of caution at this juncture. On the one hand, we have a real object and real experiences through which it is said to be given. On the other, an ideal object and the purely immanental experiences through which it is given. But, and this is absolutely critical to an understanding of Husserl's own quite characteristic idealism. It does not follow from the above that we are now confronted with two realities, a natural reality and a phenomenologically reduced reality, a transcendent and an immanent reality. The second conception of reality is not added to the first, nor does it complement it in any way whatsoever. Rather, it is brought to light as a way in which the former can be analyzed and moreover, in which the former has to be analyzed if it is ever to be possible for us to comprehend the way in which the natural world comes to acquire the very meaning which it is ordinarily 
simply assumed to possess. Now, as to such cogitatio, the conscious act taking place in this immanent sphere, three questions can arise. First, how exactly can an act be directed towards an object? Second, how in particular can this be done when the object does not exist? And third, how can different acts be directed towards one and the same object? Husserl answers these three in terms of uh, his notion of noises and noema. Noises and noema. Noises and noema are roughly Husserl's names for conscious act and its content. Thus, the noetic is the experiential manifold in and through which the objectivities in question are positive. And the noematic are those objectivities themselves, the perceived object, the remembered object, the imagined object, the objectified pleasure, etc. Noema can be thought of as the generalization of the idea of sense or meaning to the field of all conscious acts. A perception, for example, contains a noema or meaning in virtue of which it indents an object. A true perception or an accurate memory is fulfilled by the object in the way a word's sense is satisfied by a referent. Where there exists no such object, the act is still directed since it contains a meaning which could be fulfilled if the object existed. Perceptions from different perspectives or a perception and a memory may be of the same object through containing the same sense. The key to understanding both linguistic and uh, mental representation thus is the notion of meaning. But there is a crucial difference between these two kinds of representations. A linguistic expression cannot give meaning to itself, whereas a mental state or experience is intrinsically intentional because it in itself includes as an essential part of the phenomenological content that makes it the experience it is an intrinsically meaningful or meaning giving component. In other words, the meaning that makes the linguistic expressions representational comes from the outside, whereas the representational or intentional character of our mental states and experiences come from the inside. Thus, phenomenological reflection involves a peculiar and quite specific transformation of consciousness. Instead of going along with the positing of an object in the natural attitude, one makes the intentional relation to the object an object of investigation. One asks himself how the object in question comes to be posited with a meaning which adheres to it as an object of such and such a kind. Instead of perceiving, imagining or remembering, I make the act of perceiving, imagining or remembering the object of a specific phenomenological investigation with a view to specifying the essence of uh, perceptual, imaginative or memorial consciousness. Summary. The concern of the philosopher, the phenomenologist, is not with empirical facts, but with the essences in virtue of which the objects are the ones they are. The very task of phenomenology can be conceived as the analysis of those systems of correlation which obtain between the diversity and multiplicity of actuality given lived experiences and the essential structures which are posited as the ideal objects of just such a manifold of lived experience. To attain this essential intuition, we must bracket the natural standpoint, including the scientist's account of the world and our beliefs in the existence of an outside world and of our empirical psyches. Once this is done, we are free to focus on an autonomous realm of consciousness whose principal feature is to indent or direct itself towards objects. Consciousness does this by casting a net of meaning or noemata for objects to fulfill. It is roughly speaking these noemata which are the essences studied by the phenomenologist. In studying them, he lays bare the ways in which the consciousness as the trafficker in meaning animates and constitutes the world as it is encountered. Now some assignments for you. Compare and contrast Husserlian method to the methodological doubt of Descartes. Is Husserl an idealist? Justify your answer and elucidate 
the debts to and bearings on Husserlian phenomenology of existentialism. Now, some references. The Cambridge Companion to Husserl, published in 1995 by the Cambridge University Press. The Idea of Phenomenology, translated by W. Alston and uh, G. Nakanian, Martinus Nijov, the Hague, published by The Hague in 1964. Ideas One, translated by F. Kirsten for uh, Martinus Nijov, published by Hague in 1982. Ideas Two, translated by R. Rogerswick and uh, A. Schuer, Kluwer, Doddridge, 1989. Ideas Three, translated by Ted Klein and William Paul, Martinus Nijov, published by The Hague in 1980. With that, we conclude the session on Edmund Husserl. We will be back with uh, another session. Till then, goodbye.